He lay on the Wraithbone Bridge, riven by the pain of his broken back. His head turned to where his hammer had fallen. His hand still gripped the haft, though the weapon was a dozen meters away. The severed wrist painted the ground with a trickle of red. Vulcan had died before. The pain of it was a familiar thing. Never welcome, but nothing to fear. The diminishment, though. The sense of self retreating down a darkening hallway, dissolving the edges of memory. Yes, he would always dread that. A valiant effort, said the demon. He rippled his wings, Peacock proud of his capacity for fratricide. Vulcan's heart slowed. His breathing slowed with it, coming shallower, harder to pull in, strangely even harder to force out. He thought he'd closed his eyes, but the darkness was simply the epilogue of an oxygen-starved brain. Magnus said more, but Vulcan was too far gone to hear anything but a stream of syllables, bleached of meaning. Then there was nothing. He hit the wraithbone hard enough to crack his skull, feeling a line of searing red split its way down his face. On trembling limbs he rose again, using his hammer as a crutch. Blood burst from his broken jaw, a slurry of life that he vomited onto the bridge. He was certain, without touching his head, that his face was laid open to the bone. The chill of the air was ice itself. Further down the bridge, Magnus was breathing heavily, the sound punctuated by snarls. Amusing, the demon lord growled, sounding anything but amused. Vulcan took three shambling steps, swinging his hammer. He never even came close. Magnus beat his wings with a thunderclap of force, the brutal rush of air hurling Vulcan to the ground again. He couldn't reach his hammer. He started crawling towards it, knowing he wouldn't make it, knowing that there was no choice but to try. The crescent-shaped blade of Annunurta came down between his shoulders, lancing through him with an indescribable crack. He couldn't breathe couldn't move, though he kept trying to do both. Vulcan raked his fingers against the ground, trying to crawl away from the weapon that nailed him to the wraithbone floor. There was greyness, then there was black, and then the world turned. Vulcan dropped his bloodstained hammer, the slime that served Magnus for blood cooked in the weapon's power field, bubbling away to steam. It had the reek of something that had died long ago and somehow kept moving. This is what's inside you. Vulcan thought, staring at his brother. This stink, this foulness, how can you not sense it? The demon held a taloned claw to his chest where the hammer blow had blackened the creature's crimson skin. Saliva, the color and consistency of swamp water hung in strings from his maw. In his one eye was a glare of aggravation, milking over the last of Magnus's amusement. Unable to stand any longer, Vulcan went to his knees. The wounds woven upon him were a masterpiece of muscle severance. He collapsed, unstrung, bleeding across the wraithbone, staining it pink. Magnus appeared above him. Some of the demon's marshy saliva spattered into his open eyes. He brought up more blood but couldn't turn his head to cough it away and clear his mouth. Instead, he started drowning in it. Up came the Crimson King's avian foot. Vulcan saw the writhing of minuscule warp parasites, wormy things feasting between the demon's webbed, clawed toes. Then the talons came down, and then there was nothing. Vulcan staggered backwards. His lacerated skin shone with blood and effort, and the hand pressed to his throat was a futile attempt to stem the gore sheeting down his breastplate. Magnus snarled at him, bestial with infuriation. His one eye shot through with swollen capillaries. For a creature that had no cause to breathe, Magnus was laboring his chest working with the force of a bellows, his scarlet skin diamonded with sweat. Fluid ran from ruptures in his corpus, glistening leakages of the psychoorganic plasma that ran through his veins. Enough! The demon cried. Enough! Vulcan's strength deserted him with the flood of red from his throat. Magnus was suddenly taller and it took him a moment to realize he'd fallen to his knees. Awareness was receding swiftly this time. Enough, brother! The demon hissed. On that final syllable, the world darkened. And then there was nothing. Magnus backed away, spitting something in Tizkan Prosperine, a sibilant mantra that could have been a spell as easily as a curse. The demon spread fresh mutation through the wraithbone underfoot, the ancient material flowering with violet crystals that cracked in turn, disgorging clusters of unnatural insects. They died as slushy paste beneath Vulcan's boots as he advanced. I see him behind you. Magnus accused, 
I see him composing the concerto of your resurrective immortality. Vulcan said nothing, had no chance to say anything. Every cell in his body ignited in the same moment. The properties of his genetic data mutated into flammability. He took five more steps, each one slower than the last. A walking inferno of supernatural white fire. On the sixth step he fell, coming apart, crumbling in flame. It was among the most painful deaths he had yet known, and though he didn't cry out, this was as much due to the incineration of his lungs and vocal cords as it was down to his superhuman resolve. The blackness came at last. Blessedly. Finally. There was nothing. He watched the sorcerer emerge from the mist, watched the way Magnus landed on the bridge with a frenzied resignation that stank like panic. The demon was bleeding, his flesh discoloured from damage that seemed slower to regenerate each time. Every time Magnus took flight, he'd vanish into the webway's mist, and reappear a moment later, screaming in frustration. Again, and again, and again, the creature launched itself into the fog, only to emerge from the mist back above the bridge. Now he landed, eyeing the hammer in his brother's hands with a new caution. Vulcan charged at the wounded monster, battering Magnus's Kopesh aside, bringing the dragon's head hammer down on the demon's thigh. Corpus flesh shattered in a way true flesh never could and the creature retreated with a sound close to a goatish bray. Vulcan heard pain in the cry, and more. He heard anguish. The unseen coils of energy reaching from here to the Emperor's throne room thrashed as they eroded and thinned. Vulcan felt it in the air, that dissipation of focus. Hunched now, slavering, Magnus regarded him with naked hate. Ask yourself, my brother. Ask yourself why we've chosen to oppose you. Ask yourself why we let the galaxy burn. In silence, Vulcan kept advancing. The demon's growl was rife with exhausted torment. His words lacked even the strength of the hate in his stare. How many times must I destroy you? From his expression, Vulcan saw he expected no answer even as he craved one. He kept silent, taking those last steps, wondering how it would happen this time. Magnus denied his brother breath, turning the air in Vulcan's lungs to amber. A second incantation sealed Vulcan's lips together with a weave of fleshcrafting sorcery. The sorcerer watched his brother asphyxiate on the Wraithbone Bridge, and once the struggles had ceased he backed away from the body. For Vulcan, after the last minutes of strangling red, there was pulsing black, and then nothing at all. Magnus retreated, holding his broken blade as if reluctant to cast it aside. Father's plan would never have worked. Even you must see that, walking in this world between worlds. Save your breath. This is your execution, Magnus. Not your trial. Vulcan charged and froze. His joints refused to obey him. He stood still, not tense, merely motionless, held in a stasis so absolute he couldn't feel his heartbeat or the hammer in his hand. All sensory flow between his mind and body was severed. Magnus, looking weirdly beyond reckoning, stalked forward with his broken blade. He swung. Vulcan's body fell one way, his head another. Magnus howled, retreating, shielding his broken face with one great arm, and raising a kinetic barrier with his other hand outstretched. He no longer hissed defiance, but it was written starkly across his mutilated features. One side of the demon's skull, or whatever passed for bone structure inside his corpus, was malformed with the last impact of Vulcan's hammer. A blow that would have destroyed a land raider had only caved in part of the Crimson King's head. You do not know, Magnus breathed, why you fight. Vulcan ran in, swinging, grunting with the effort. On the eleventh blow he felt the Kine barrier waver, softening against the incoming impacts. On the nineteenth it burst with an expulsion of force that bred more cracks across the Wraithbone Bridge. At the last moment, Magnus turned the hammer aside with a desperate, telekinetic shove. You do not even understand what you're fighting for. Vulcan was relentless, forcing the demon back, endlessly back, making him expend energy in pushing each blow aside. Every swing was deflected at the last moment by telekinetic pressure, the last one coming closest, snapping one of the ornate tusks from the demon's chestplate. Magnus screamed, his etheric form swelling, and with a bellow of concussive force he hurled his brother from the bridge, throwing him out into the empty mist. 
Magnus's laughter, ragged and forced, receded as Vulcan fell. There was a seamless, windless eternity of golden fog, then darkness, and nothing. Incineration, decapitation, suffocation, exsanguination, electrocution, dissolution, evisceration, transmutation. Uncontrolled genetic blooming saturating him with cancers lethal enough to kill within seconds. There was pain each time. Pain enough to drive a mortal beyond the boundaries of reason. Pain enough to render even an immortal mad. And there were times, years, over the course of his life, that Vulcan's thoughts had become a fragile composition at risk of breaking apart at the slightest provocation. The gift bestowed upon him wasn't gentle on his mind, but he was born to endure. He was built, consciously, or by whatever winds of fate breathed into the process, to endure what no others could. There was always pain, then blackness, then nothing. And after the nothing there was a wraithbone bridge, a duty to a distant father and a hammer in his hands. Magnus was down on one knee, his wings broken, his face a cracked portrait. No more, Vulcan. He dribbled the words through a crushed jaw. No more. Vulcan circled the down creature. Red eyes narrowed for even the merest movement. The demonic blood on his hammer steamed with the smell of a funeral pyre. He didn't trust his brother's vulnerability. And he saw his caution reflected at him in Magnus's blood-webbed eye. I sense the energies you have wrought, said Vulcan. Thinner, weaker, but still curring in the air around us. You are still attacking father. He expected Magnus to laugh. Instead, the sorcerer sighed. You deal with forces you do not comprehend. Killing me may let the Emperor breathe easier, but it will not free him from the Golden Throne. Vulcan's tone was ice and iron. Nevertheless, you die. So finish it. Magnus hunched over, lowering his head for the executioner's blow. Save the Emperor. Let ignorance triumph over truth. Vulcan hesitated. Can you afford to wait any longer, little dragon? Magnus slowly raised his head, and in his gaze was the mockery Vulcan had been expecting. Where is your urgency now? Where is all that righteousness? Knowing it was a trap, knowing he had no choice but to spring it, Vulcan raised his hammer. As it fell... The world turned. It wasn't blackness this time. He saw planets turning in the deep night, beautiful no matter their colours or surface conditions, beautiful for their infinite complexity. Vulcan never looked at a planet and saw territory, cities or resources. He saw a geological duel, a sphere formed by astrophysical law and the geomathematical processes that bound it all together. Each world was unique, shaped just so. He believed there was beauty in that. He drifted through space, descending to one world until it was a plateau beneath him of hazy blue atmosphere and immense wilderness. He knew it at once. Prospero, said Magnus, by his side. His brother wasn't a demon. Magnus was the man he'd been long ago. Red of skin, darkened further by the sun, clad in a toga of white silk. He smelled of ink, fine parchment and lies. I thought we could speak, the sorcerer said. One last time. Vulcan tensed, preparing to. No, brother. Magnus showed his pale red palms, bare of any weapon. No time is passing. In the labyrinth of the old ones, our hands are around each other's throats, with death yet to be decided. Here, we exist between heartbeats. Vulcan stared into his brother's remaining eye. I believe you, he said. Magnus gave a tired smile. It has been a long time since I heard those words. Prospero turned beneath them. Vulcan gazed at the wildlands of the vast Pangean continent and the distant silver pinprick of Tisca, the world's only city. Speak, then. And you will listen. Vulcan nodded. Very well. This is what I would have you understand, brother. The Imperium is the lie we tell ourselves to make sense of a reality we fear to face. We tell each other that it is necessary, that we do what must be done, 
that whatever might replace it would be worse. But look at all we do not say. Farad is a tyrant, and you, out of all of us, should have seen that first. The Imperium is built on the lies of a would-be god and the violence of his crusade. What benevolent monarch instigates a crusade? Under the Emperor, we have perpetuated a holy war that has sucked worlds dry of resources and cost billions upon billions of lives. We have spent life like meaningless currency, all because one man said we must. How many cultures have we annihilated, Vulcan? How many have we assimilated and robbed of their vitality, replacing innovation with conformity? How much knowledge have we destroyed because father decided no one was allowed to learn it? Vulcan considered this. The planet rolled on, sedate and slow despite its relative astronomical speed. He realized he wasn't wounded here. He wore his armor, but it was pristine, not the scraps of torn ceramite left to him on the bridge. This is how it got to you, isn't it? Vulcan knew the answer even as he asked the question. The creature that gouged its way inside your soul and laid its eggs there. The thing that pulls on your strings. Did it promise you knowledge? Did it paint the Emperor as the death of enlightenment? Magnus' expression answered for him. Long red hair fell to frame his face, and the sorcerer brushed it back from his cheeks. The Imperial truth is a lie. The empire we built cannot be reformed, only overthrown. From violence it was born, and in violence it must end. Don't you see? Once the board is swept clean, we can start again with our eyes open, aware of the truths of the universe. You make this sound like a principle to stand, said Vulcan. As if all you have done, all Horus has done, could ever be justified. Magnus turned to him sharply. I? What do I have to justify? Each time I was attacked, I defended myself. Each time they tried to silence me, I made sure to speak out. The Imperium lavished punishments upon my legion, draping its hypocrisy over us a funeral shroud. We fought back. Vulcan met Magnus's gaze, seeing the ironclad surety there. This was futile, he knew it, yet the words came forth anyway. Look at the horrors your side has unleashed upon Terra. The massacres, the mutations. Magnus, you are taking part in the extinction of your species. You cannot truly think you have done nothing wrong. Even you, brother. Even you in your arrogance cannot believe this is justified. Necessity justifies all, and this is necessary. Without this primeval force, without this chaos, there would be stagnation. Ignorance instead of illumination. Existence instead of life. I did not write the laws of our universe, brother. I take no joy in the truth of reality. But I won't hide from it. Vulcan looked at him as if he spoke in another tongue. Necessary, you say? Magnus nodded, and Vulcan continued. Necessary according to whom? The alien god that exalted you and now demands you commit genocide? Magnus clenched his teeth, and the world turned. But not far. It turned to reveal Tiska, City of Light, metropolis of white pyramids and silver spires. The city was aflame beneath them, burning from the reigning hellfire of an imperial fleet. The golden vessels of the Emperor's Chosen, the sleek black hunting ships of the Silent Sisters, the many many warships in the storm cloud grey of the space wolves the raising of prospero there was murder in magnus's eye murder and sorrow bear witness to our brother russ bringing death to my homeworld and all of its people tell me vulcan would you have reacted with temperance to this had it been the destruction of nocturne vulcan didn't need to stare at the orbital bombardment he'd read the reports He'd seen the pics and the footage and spoken to many of the custodians that took part in the ground assault. Nothing unfolding here was a revelation he wished to experience twice. Horus was lied to by Horus, deceived into attacking. I know. It changes nothing. But it should. You who value truth so highly, willingly align yourself with the one that engineers Prospero's death. And when the Space Wolf's fleet arrived in your sky, what did you do, Magnus? Did you try to enlighten us? Did you use your power to prevent the assault? Or did your belief in your own persecution leave you to assume the worst of the Emperor's intentions? All witness accounts say you languished in your tower, welcoming the destruction as your penance, until you decided to fight in the final hours, 
when it was far too late to stop the massacre. Vulcan gestured to the destruction raining from the upper atmosphere. Launch strikes, drop pods, the slower trails of gunships making their descent. Why would the Emperor order you and your entire legion dead? Did you not stop to wonder at the scale of this misunderstanding? Magnus laughed at the questions, the sound wet and bitter. He gestured away from the burning city and the world turned, falling away. They were in the webway again, but no longer upon the lost bridge. They drifted through the oval tunnels, following angles that hurt the human eye. Always ahead of them, an avatar of fire blazed through the tunnels, shattering the wraithbone membranes without heed, blind and deaf to the horde of demons surging into the webway in its wake. I did this, said Magnus. I thought he wished to punish me for ruining his great work. For a moment, Magnus paused, gazing at the host of Neverborn darkening the tunnels as if seeing them for the first time. But how was I to know? He refused to tell me of his grand plan. If he had told me, Vulcan resisted the urge to spit at the sudden foul taste on his tongue. Again, you see the worst in all others, absorbing yourself of blame. Why did you need to know of the great work? You were warned not to toy with the warp. We all were. But you couldn't resist. You believed that you knew more, that you knew best. And why is it that you alone lament being kept unappraised of father's plans? Why is Sanguinius not enraged that he never knew of the Webway project? Why am I not enraged that I was kept ignorant of it? Why did you need to know? Magnus's eye gleamed with the reflection of the burning icon ahead, his former self, years before, racing to warn the Emperor of Horus's betrayal, reducing the Webway to unsanctified rubble with his passing. Had I known the truth? I would never have done what I did. Father should have told me. Vulcan laughed, unable to believe what he was hearing. How could Father have predicted you would defy his one command? Not only did you use the warp against his orders, you fueled your psychic warning with human sacrifice. How could any of us have known you were capable of such barbarity? Magnus exhaled slowly, his hand clutching the folds of his toga. He spoke a word of power, and the world turned. They were in the throne room. The blazing avatar had incarnated before the scientists and techno-magicians of the Emperor's secret work. It had forced the webway portal open, making it radiate with wounded light. Already it grew dark with the silhouettes of demons as they drew near. The custodians present, precious few of them, for how could they have anticipated the sudden death of the Emperor's dream, opened fire on the image of ghostly flame. It ignored their paltry defiance, and it ignored the explosions its arrival had birthed across the great laboratory. It hovered before the Emperor, like some spectre of religious revelation from the ancient tomes, when such things were believed by credulous men. I had to warn him, said Magnus, watching the scene. No, Vulcan said gently. You believed you had to warn him. You believed as you always believe, that you knew best that you had to act, that you alone knew what had to be done. And never once did you think through all this destruction that there was something deceiving you. The sorcerer glared at him. Why do you speak to me as if I were a lowly pawn in this game of regicide? The War Master and the Emperor both knew I am the most valuable piece on the board. Vulcan was unmoved by the sorcerer's words and by the cataclysm playing out before him. His tone was patient, as it had been in the days before the war. Vanity is what leads you, Magnus. You choke on arrogance, unable to see that you are the architect of your own downfall. All the others, all of Horus's broken monsters, at least they can see the bars of their cages. Even Horus, driven out of his mind to serve as a hive for the Pantheon, know in his sole core that he has lost control. You are the only one that still believes he is free. In silence, Magnus shook his head. The world turned with the motion. They remained in the throne room, but the great machines were overloaded and black, slain by esoteric forces, and the industry of the laboratory was replaced by a militancy of a garrison presence. It was no longer a place of vision, it was a barracks, and it was closer to now. This was how the throne room had looked when Vulcan had last been here. Vulcan and Magnus were present at this point in the recent past, as well as drifting through it in their current incarnations. They watched themselves at the foot of the Golden Throne. 
Vulcan implacable but for the regret lining his features, Magnus manifest as a being of light, shimmering in and out of the layers of reality perceptible to the human eye. Here, said the Magnus of now, watching the Magnus of then. Here is where I made my choice. You saw the Emperor make his final offer to me. You heard him promise me a new legion, if I would only forsake Horus and come back to you all. A matter of mere weeks ago, brother. Will you tell me you've forgotten it? Vulcan sighed. He suddenly seemed weary. That is not what transpired here, Magnus. The last unstained shard of your soul burst into the throne room and begged to be saved. With a heavy heart, father refused you. That is what I saw. That is what happened. Magnus's laughter was blunt, practically a derisive bark. And you say I'm the one who has been deceived? Vulcan was too tired to raise the bait. He met derision with solemnity. This thing that runs through you, this chaotic force you proclaim as freedom, is not a disease to be caught on contact. It is the layer of emotion behind the reality. A poison that has achieved near sentience. It makes its prey into willing victims in their own damnation. You are riven by it, Magnus. Hollowed out by it. And it was already in your legion, in your son's blood, and genetic code, in the form of the fresh change. And when you dealt with the Pantheon, believing you had cured your children, all you really achieved was a deepening of the taint, hiding it from sight, delaying the inevitable. This thing, this force cannot be cured, Magnus. You cannot pray it away once the rot sets in. Once you are on the path, your fate is sealed. Wait, Vulcan. Wait. How can this be? How do you know all of this? In the silence that reigned in the wake of those words, the throne room began to fade. Golden mist hazed its way around them, revealing patches of wraithbone and architecture. Vulcan was relentless, his voice growing firmer. How could the Emperor ever trust you now? Why would he offer you a new legion, let alone a place at his side? You dreamed up your own redemption just to give yourself something to rage against, because you need to feel as though you are the one choosing, not having the choices made for you. The creature that exalted you will never let you see the chains that bind you to its will. The mist was everywhere, thickening. Magnus felt the change upon him, and beneath the sensation of power was a pull, a wrenching, the sensation of a trillion filaments woven into the cells of his body, dragging at him. How? Magnus asked, barely above a breath. Where the mist touched him, his flesh was darkening, swelling. The shadows of ragged wings loomed above his shoulders. How do you know all of this? Vulcan remained in place, saying nothing, doing nothing. Who are you? demanded Magnus. The world turned and this time it wasn't moved by Magnus's will. The first strike of the hammer pounded Magnus to the wraithbone ground, a magma flow of ectoplasm running from his riven skull. The second cracked the bones of one wing, splintering the spine and shoulder blade beneath. The third eradicated the demon's right hand, rendering it into dissolving paste. Breathless, standing over the paralyzed remnants of his mutated brother, Vulcan raised his hammer. In the same moment, Magnus somehow lifted his head. The sorcerer stared past Vulcan, over his executioner's shoulder. Either he saw nothing, or he saw without the use of his eye, which was a burst fruit of a thing, turned to a leaking pulp in its shattered socket. Wait, the demon wheezed, the word ruined by the graveyard of his teeth. Father, wait! Father is far from here, Vulcan almost said, wondering what visions were conjured in his brother's dying mind. But he saw the fear on Magnus's face, imprinted with the lines of regret. It was enough to make him hesitate. I don't have to do this. But he did. Not just because it would free the Emperor from the Sorcerer's assault. Not just because thousands were dying in front of the Eternity Gate. But because this was how the arch enemy drilled inside a heart and soul. The creatures sank their tendrils into a person's hesitations, cracking them open to become doubts. They caressed along the edges of someone's virtues, heightening them, souring them into flaws. They would do the same with Vulcan's mercy. Mercy was how the Pantheon would welcome him, and he would begin to do their will. He would trust someone that breathed deceit. He would spare the life of a man that must die, and he would feel righteous, as his nine traitorous brothers felt righteous. 
deaf to the laughter of the gods as he moved to their etheric melodies. Like his brothers, he would believe it was his own virtue guiding his hand. I see now, the blind demon whispered. Forgive me. He lies. The emperor's voice was ice behind Vulcan's eyes. It ground into his temples from the inside, seeking a way out of his skull. He lies even to himself. It is all he can do now. Finish it. Magnus grunted as if overhearing the words. His contrition soured, becoming spite. As his expression darkened, the Emperor's tone struck Vulcan's mind with the force of a storm's wind. They prey upon your mercy! He gathers his strength! Kill him! The two brothers moved in opposing harmony, perfect motion reflections of one another. Vulcan dealt the executioner's blow, and then the same moment Magnus dealt his. Vulcan couldn't be killed. That left only one recourse. It started with a pattern, a twinned helix of genetic code, the equation at the core of every mortal's existence. Even with his eye destroyed, Magnus could see this calculation written through his brother's blood. Signifiers of their father's arcane science were flowing through Vulcan's veins. He followed the calculations, the process metaphysically no different from reading the notes of a song from the page and hearing its melody in his mind. Once he could make out the flow of these blood mathematics, he followed them along their temporal axis, a journey through time, seeing cell degradation and replenishment, sensing through atmospheric and environmental shift all the places his brother had been, then branching outward, a horizon-wide view of the souls Vulcan had met, the deeds he'd performed, the worlds on which he'd walked, learning the permutations of the code, the answers at the ends of its inevitable questions. He had seen enough. The sorcerer pulled back, plunging again into the core of the code, feeling the currents of life flowing through his brother's body. He closed the jaws of his reaching mind around the strands of his secret pattern, clutching not to the code itself, but the skeins it wove. Blood mathematics. Genetics. The processes of life. The harder he held to it, the deeper his touch went, down to the level of molecules, to protons and neutrons, to atoms. For one moment his mind was entirely scattered throughout Vulcan's flesh, diluted through the avenues of his bloodstream. It was enough. It would work. If Magnus could not kill him, he would unmake him. The sorcerer severed the code strands. He pulled at the calculations, unsolving them. He unraveled the strings and skeins of the blood mathematics, a literal unmaking at the molecular level. The sundering of Vulcan's very atoms. Physically, Vulcan came apart at the biological seams. His black skin ruptured with holes that siphoned light. These bloodless ruptures spread through his bones, his organs, his armor. What remained of his skin ignited, then blew away an instant later as ash in the webway's sourceless breeze. A partially articulated skeleton, bound together by disintegrating tendons, staggered back as its eyeballs caught fire. Magnus hemorrhaged power. He poured himself into the process, diluting his essence across the sine wave of his brother's existence. When the dissolving skeleton stumbled, he felt a laugh wheeze through his own ruined mouth. The process was imperfect. It could only be imperfect, devoid of ritual structure and born out of frantic will. But it was working. A testament to his might and to the choices made to reach this point. This sense of exultant pride was his second to last thought. Pride in himself, in what he was capable of, unweaving his brother's existence, rewriting reality to obey his desires. And yet, he couldn't understand how the man in front of him could still be on his feet. He couldn't believe this flayed, immolated thing being erased from existence endured all of this and still swung its hammer. He couldn't lose here. He couldn't die. He couldn't. And then there was silence. A stillness descended across the webway, as sensory and as real as the golden mist. The thing that had been Vulcan stood motionless in the sudden quiet. It held onto its hammer for a moment longer. With its skinless grip fused to the weapon's haft, it had no choice but to keep it in its clutches. The joints of its elbows gave out with straining creaks, lengthening on strings of melted tendons, then breaking apart. Only then did the hammer drop to the wraithbone floor, along with the Primarch's forearms. The corpse of Vulcan fell to its knees beside the headless body of Magnus the Red. There they rested, at the heart of Magnus's folly. Humanity and microcosm, a study in fratricide. The skeletal corpse's final breath whistled out through charred teeth. There was silence. 
then darkness, then nothing at all. Later, a figure walked alone through the Eldari necropolis, passing beneath the spired monuments to the failure of two species' attempt to tame the webway. It moved with a care for its wounds, sometimes shambling but never stopping. It looked more like a skeleton than a man, its blackened bones bare to the golden mist. It was either dead but alive or alive but dead. The effect was the same, no matter which way an observer came down on the philosophical divide. The living dead thing would have to fight its way back. It knew this. It was ready. The sound of the figure's passage was iron grinding against the wraith bone. Behind it, in a fleshless grip, it dragged a hammer. So, there we have it. The conclusion of Magnus and Vulcan's battle in the webway. I love this whole scene, but I had to split it across two videos due to the span of Echoes of Eternity that it covers. It would have been like over an hour long had I tried to do it in a single vid, which, like, while that certainly would have been cool and probably less effort than me, I am operating with, shall we say, less than an optimal laptop for producing these excerpts for you guys. And uh, my storage space isn't great. With how fast we're picking up traction, however, I'll definitely be investing in a better machine. One that can handle having a project file larger than 7 gigabytes, which is what part one was sized at. <laughs> As always, I only cover parts from the novels that I absolutely, truly adore. And so I fully recommend that you go and read Echoes of Eternity if you haven't already. There are a lot more truly iconic scenes in the book, and it's probably among Aaron Dembski Bowden's best work. Thank you all for watching so much. The pace we're growing at is like genuinely astounding to me and I'm glad I'm able to provide some entertainment to you guys. If you haven't already, please do hit the subscribe button and pop a like on the vid if you think it deserves it. We also have a Discord server, by the way, which I'll be honest, I'd totally forgotten about. Um, so if you want a place to nerd out about Games Workshop's IPs with like-minded people, come join. Link is in the description. Peace and love, everybody, and I hope to see you in the next one.